Well, if you would please open your Bibles again at Romans and chapter 12. Our series is entitled Overcoming Evil. And today we come to Romans 12 and verse 16, just the one verse that's before us today, the title, uh, Overcoming Evil with Humility. And let us hear the Word of God, Romans and chapter 12 and verse 16. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never, never be wise in your own sight. Now, there could hardly be, I think, a simpler verse of Scripture, live with, in harmony with one another. Uh, harmony, as all musicians know, uh, a pleasing arrangement of different parts. You get harmony where different notes are joined together uh, in such a way that the one enriches and complements another. Harmony is not unison, we know that. Um, You don't get harmony by everybody playing the same note. You uh, get harmony when different notes are brought together. Uh, So harmony doesn't mean that everyone thinks the same or everyone does the same or everyone is the same. Harmony is not unison. Harmony is not discord. Discord is when notes are brought together in such a way that one diminishes or distorts another. Now, live in harmony very simply means live in such a way that you enrich and complement each other. Let it be that your being joined together makes you more than any of you could be on your own. And there is a display of, of beauty that happens by taking what is distinct and different and making it one. That's what's at the heart of what the apostle is saying here. Of course, you see this beautifully in marriage, where God takes the man and God takes the woman. The two are different, but in marriage they become one. And there is this beautiful complementarity in which together, uh, like two notes in a chord, they become more than either of them would be on their own. And you see this in the very nature of God Himself. Think about it. There is one God. He is Father, and He is Son, and He is Holy Spirit. God is one in nature. He is one in purpose. He is one in love. There's a beauty, a glory, a majesty, a joy, a blessing, a peace, a purpose that we see in God and that we see flowing from God. And and now God speaks about the same thing in regards to His church. Live in harmony with one another. The one another here obviously relates to Christian brothers and sisters redeemed by Christ, brought together in the family of God. Here is then a distinct calling for all of us as Christian believers, live in harmony with one another. Now, friends, let's just pause there. Is there anything that is more obviously or more desperately needed in our beloved country and indeed in our world today. I mean, here we are living in a time that is marked by common consensus. There's one thing on which everyone's agreed, that we're marked by polarization, that we're marked by division, that we're marked by conflict over race and over religion and over money and on and on and on. And the world desperately, desperately in this polarized and divided world in which we live, desperately needs to see something different. And God says, now this is your calling. Let it be seen in my church. Let there be a place on the face of the world where people actually do live in harmony with one another. So the clarity of this, you don't need any more explanation of the verse. It's immediately obvious what it means. The question is, what stops us? The question, when God's command is so crystal clear, is what then is holding us back? Why is it that we find it so hard to do this very simple thing, this very clear thing, this so needed thing that God so obviously calls us to right here? And there is one answer to that question, why do we find it so hard? And the answer is right in this verse, and the answer is pride. Verse 16, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. That's what it's going to take to live in harmony. Never be wise 
in your own eyes. Now, that's our focus today. It's very simple. I don't think it could be more important. It is absolutely crucial to overcoming the great evils that are around us. Do not be overcome by this evil that you see around you. I'd rather overcome evil with good. Now, notice that pride uh, in this verse has two very obvious expressions. The first I'm going to describe as arrogance, uh, do not be haughty. Now, to be haughty is very simply to think of yourself as being better than other people. In other words, to look down on others because you feel superior in regards to your intellect or your gifts or your life or, uh, or your achievements or whatever. And let's be candid, it is very easy for us to get the idea that this is no big deal. I mean, after all, in this country, what's wrong with a little bit of swagger? Um, but remember that pride is the original sin. It is in Scripture the sin from which all other sins flow. It is the root. That is why in Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16, we are told that there are six things that God hates, seven that are an abomination to Him. And what's number one? What's number one is, right, what's here? Haughty eyes. Why is haughty eyes number one? Because it's the root of pride that leads to all the other sins that God also hates and that He also abominates, which include lies. Why do we tell lies? Because we want people to think better of us than we actually are. It includes murder. Why, why does murder happen? Because one person thinks that his life is more important or her interests are more important than the life of another person. Do not be haughty. Now, I want to apply this to us as practically as I possibly can uh, today, and particularly in regards to how we speak to one another, especially when we disagree. And it seems to me that we are at a moment in public life where this theme among Christians is especially important. There is a fascinating letter that was written by John Newton, uh, who wrote, of course, the hymn Amazing Grace. That's what he's best known for. And he wrote to a friend at a time when the friend was about to engage in some public controversy. Uh, this friend was going to write a response to the view of someone else with which he strongly disagreed. And so, Newton wrote to this friend about the spiritual dangers of engaging in public controversy. Now, in those days, of course, there were very few people um, who really had a platform and therefore an opportunity to engage in any kind of public controversy. But social media, of course, has changed all that entirely in our time, and now every person, every one of us, has the opportunity in our time to post comments expressing opinions, whether agreeing or disagreeing with the views of others. So, social media has become a platform in which not only are our opinions um, broadcast, but also, all too often, our pride is exposed. And if it's hidden because it's behind a screen name, we must remember every time we write something that it is never hidden from God. Now, Newton's words are really worth bearing in mind before you post or say anything in public. So, let me read to you from the letter. This is him writing to his friend. Dear sir, certain formality in those days, even with a friend, as you are likely to be engaging in controversy and your love of truth, which is a good thing, is joined to a natural warmth of temper. Don't you love that? That's a very discreet way of saying, I know what you're like. You know, once you get going, you can really fire off and uh, uh, your love of truth, I know that your love of truth is gauged to a natural uh, warmth of temper. My friendship makes me solicitous on your behalf. 
He says, you're on the strongest side, for truth is great and it must prevail. In other words, he says, I agree with your side of this argument. But I would have you be more than a conqueror and to triumph not only over your adversary, but also to triumph over yourself. Then he makes uh, a number of points, and I'll just pick up on two. The first is consider your opponent. I wish that before you set pen to paper against him, and during the whole time you are preparing your answer, that you may commend him by earnest prayer to the Lord's teaching and blessing. This practice will have a direct tendency to conciliate your heart to love and to pity him, and with such disposition, uh, such disposition will have a good influence on every page that you write. I really, I think I should send this to the news media and say, you know, give this to everyone to read before anyone appears on the program, you know. It, here's how a Christian engages in honest disagreement where passionately different views are held. Then he says this, if you count him a believer, though greatly mistaken on the subject of debate between you, remember that the Lord loves him and therefore that you must not despise him or treat him harshly. And if you look upon him as an unconverted person, if you think that the guy that you're answering is actually not even a Christian, then he is the more proper object of your compassion than he is of your anger. Alas, he knows not what he does. Then he continues, having considered your opponent, he says, think about yourself, consider yourself. He says, we find, this is Newton speaking, very few writers of controversy who have not been manifestly hurt by it. Either they grow in a sense of their own importance, or they imbibe an angry and contentious spirit, or they withdraw their attention from those things that are the food of a life of faith and spend their time and their strength upon matters which at most are of secondary value. It's what the spiritual dangers of controversy. Then he ends with this. What will it profit a man if he gains his cause silences, uh, uh, and silences his adversary if at the same time he loses the humble, tender frame of spirit in which the Lord delights and to which the promise of his presence is made? You win the argument in such a way that you grieve the Spirit of God and no longer experience the blessing of His presence on your life. What a deal is that? Because God says it. You see, His, His presence, the promise of His presence is tied to humility. This is Isaiah in chapter 57 and verse 15. I dwell where? In heaven and with him who is humble and of a contrite spirit. These are the two places where the presence of God is found and known, in heaven and with him who is of a humble and of a contrite spirit. He opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You know, God hates pride, and he will destroy it. You all know from Proverbs chapter 16, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit, that word again, before a fall. God opposes the proud, the haughtiness of man shall be humbled, says the prophet Isaiah, and the lofty pride of men shall be brought low, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Do not be haughty. Do not be haughty. Now, pride has two expressions then. The first is this sense of superiority over uh, other people, um, looking down on others, um, thinking that you are better on others than others God has placed around you. The second, that's the first. Here's the second, and I've called this after a lot of thought, independence. Never be wise, says the Scripture, in your own sight. Now, I thought carefully about using this word independence because 
um, the instinct of many of us, including myself, uh, would be to want to defend it. I mean, we don't want to depend on others, right? We want to stand on our own two feet. And that sense of individual responsibility surely is something that is right and is honoring to God. But listen to what the Scripture is saying to us here. Listen to it. Get over that and now listen to this. Never be wise in your own sight. In other words, the man or woman who feel, who is wise in his or her own sight is the person who feels that they have everything that they need in and of themselves. This is the person who feels he doesn't need to listen to others. The way he sees it, he already has all that he needs Within himself, do not be wise in your own eyes. I've got all the wisdom that I need. Why would I need anyone else? Why do I need to listen to others? So, there are two manifestations of pride that keep us from this great calling that we began the verse with, uh, living in harmony. One is to think that you are better than others. The other is to think that you don't need others. And of course, Paul speaks about that so clearly, doesn't he, in 1 Corinthians, when he uses that illustration of the church being like the body of Christ. And he says, don't let any Christian uh, get the idea that you've got so much within yourself that you don't need anyone else. He puts it this way, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I think he chooses that one because of the uh, the function of the head. You know, the head can't say, I'm the head, so I don't need the feet. The very nature of the body is that God has granted an interdependence by bringing these different parts together. It's the same thing as being, is being said in regards to this wonderful theme of harmony. So, the proud person then is the person who thinks in his heart or in her heart, I have all that I need in myself. I make my own decisions. I run my own life. I am a Christian, so why do I need to be a member of the church? That's the eye saying to the hand, I don't need you. I got everything I need on my own. And that is a very common spirit that is found among Christian people in our culture in our day. Now, I want to focus in particularly on what pride looks like in relation to the Scripture. This is the application that I want to focus in on, um, especially because the word wise is used here, and the word wise obviously relates to the life of the mind. Always remember, friends, that there is an intellectual dimension to repentance as well as a moral one. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 7, here's how God says it, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. So, right there, do you see the two dimensions of repentance? Repentance involves a change in ways, that is, actions and behavior, but it also involves a change in thoughts. In other words, the Scripture is saying that there are certain ways of thinking that a person has to abandon in coming to Jesus Christ. And one of them is the self-sufficiency that says, I have all the wisdom that I need in myself, which is what the Apostle Paul is uh, warning us uh, about here in this verse. Now, I want to take some time today to tell you the testimony of a man who for many years was wise in his own sight and then experienced uh, a remarkable change uh, of heart. Uh, the man's name is Thomas Oden. Um, uh, his book is called A Change of Heart. I found it absolutely compelling. It is a very, very honest confession 
from a brilliant man and a widely influential Christian who has written more than 50 books and uh, articles and has had great influence both in the earlier and in the later chapter of his life, but the influence he has had has gone in two very different directions. I'm telling the story of Thomas Oden from his book because I want you to see the effects of being wise in your own eyes. If you are wise in your own eyes, you will evaluate the Bible in the light of your own wisdom. That's what you do. Wise in your own eyes, you will evaluate the Bible in the light of your own wisdom. And what that means is that you will take what fits with what you already believe, and then you will discard everything else. And therefore, instead of listening to the voice of God, what you're actually doing is you're only listening to an echo of your own voice, uh, being reaffirmed in things that you already think, and failing completely to hear anything in which God is speaking to you about something that needs to change. Now, let me tell you this man's story. Thomas Oden was born in 1931 and had great influence during the massive cultural changes that took place in the 1960s. He was raised in uh, rural Oklahoma, grew up in a Methodist church, and so from early in his life professed Christian faith. He had a passion for social justice, and he describes his student years uh, by saying, I was a Marxist utopian dreamer. I began, and I'm quoting here, I began to see the vision of a world where all weapons would be banned, opening the way for a world government that would seek social justice and where peace and sanity would prevail. He then describes his relationship with the Scripture. Now, here's someone who's brought up in the church, and here's how he's describing his own relationship with the Bible. He says, it was a filtering process which permitted those sources, that's the Bible, to speak to me only insofar as they could meet my conditions, my worldview, and my assumptions as a modern person. With regards to prayer, he says, in college, this is 19 years old, in college, I lost the capacity for heartfelt prayer. Moving beyond his college years, he says this, I went into the ministry, ordained as a Christian minister, to use the church to elicit political change. So, get this in your mind. Here's a youngster growing up in church, uh, begins to embrace some particular views. What's important for our purpose is he filters. That's his own word. He filters everything in the Bible through his own worldview, loses any interest in heartfelt prayer, and then says the best thing we can do with the church is use it as a vehicle for political change. He then speaks about how he came under the influence of Saul Alinsky in what he describes as the Chicago School of Push and Shove Politics. He says this, very interesting. Alinsky taught me that radicals precipitate social crises by four things strategic deception, surprise attacks on vulnerabilities, direct action, and rhetorical cover-up. He then describes himself in these early years as, he says, I was a movement theologian. I was continually shifting from one movement to another towards whatever new idea I thought might seem to be an acceptable modernization of Christianity. I was floating, he says, on the wave of secularization. The trick, his word, the trick was to learn to sound Christian while undermining traditional Christianity. That's what I was doing, he says. He then makes a comment on the word theology. You know, the word theos at the beginning of that word is the Greek word for God, the study of God. So he says this, to me, the theos in theology had become little more than a question mark. I could confidently discuss philosophy, psychology, and social change, 
but God made me uneasy. God made me uneasy. Resurrection and atonement were words that I choked on. The gospel was not an event of divine salvation. It was about human psychological experiences of trust and freedom from anxiety, guilt, and boredom. It's absolutely fascinating reading his story in which he had a theological touch on just about every major psychological movement in the 1960s and the 1970s. The resurrection, he says, was not about something that actually happened, but was, quote, a community's memory of an unexplained event, though he makes this fascinating concession. He says, even then, I could not explain to myself nor to others how Christianity could possibly be built on an event that never happened. I could never explain that, he said. Then he makes this confession. I did not examine my own motives. He says, I I examined everyone else's motives but I did not examine my own. And the Bible words for this are arrogance, moral blindness. I confess now that I became entrapped with the desire for upward mobility in an academic environment. That was what was driving me, he said. One more quote because we come to the turn. He says, my past visions of vast plans for social change had irreparably harmed many innocents, especially the unborn. The sexually permissive lifestyle which I had not joined but which I failed to critique led to a generation of fatherless children. The political policies I had promoted were intended to increase justice by political means. They ended in diminishing personal responsibility and freedom. And many of the seemingly humane psychological therapies I had supported may have made people more miserable, less able to choose wisely or to seek the virtues that are required for happiness. I, he said, had to learn to repent to see my own arrogance and to acknowledge my own limitations. The turn, you say, how did a turn happen? The turn in Thomas Oden's life began in 1970 when at the age of 39, he was appointed as a tenured professor at Drew University in New Jersey. There he met and became very close friends with a Jewish scholar by the name of Will Herberg. And they must have been good friends because Herberg seems to have spoken to uh, Odin in remarkably direct terms. So, So Herberg is a Jewish scholar, not a Christian. And uh, Odin is a professing Christian. And here's this Jewish scholar, and let me uh, give you the account of their interaction. Odin says, my irascible, endearing Jewish friend leaned into my face and told me I was densely ignorant of Christianity. (laughs) And he simply couldn't permit me to throw my life away. If you are ever going to become a credible theologian instead of a know-it-all pundit, you had better restart your life on firmer ground, he said. You are not a theologian except in name only, even if you are paid to be one. Well, sometimes faithful are the wounds of a friend. So, Thomas Oden then gave himself to reading, never done this before, the church fathers. That's what uh, Herberg told him to do. And what he discovered in the church fathers was that instead of always trying to say something new, the church fathers had one priority, and that was to be faithful to Scripture. So, I want you to see what is happening here because it's really important. Here is a man with a brilliant mind, and he feels that he has what he needs in himself, and so he doesn't pray. And when he reads the Bible, he only accepts what he already thinks, and he discards everything else. He uses the filter. He says, well, I go with that, but I I, I filter everything else away because I'm the one who's got the wisdom in me, you see. 
Why is it in your own eyes? He's a professor of theology. He's teaching students, but he says by his own confession, God was only a question mark to me, a little more than a question mark to me. The resurrection, in his view, was merely the community's memory of an unexplained event. The atonement was a word that he choked on. Everything he writes, and there's a catalog of books that he now regrets. Everything he writes is cutting edge, new, innovative, with his own initials stamped on it. He's got the idea, nobody's ever said this before. This is how you rise in the academic world. And then he discovers the church fathers, and not one of them's trying to say something new. What they're all trying to do is be faithful to Scripture. And Odin's change of heart was sealed in 1971 when, fascinatingly, he had a dream. And in this dream, he saw himself walking through the cemetery in New Haven, a nearby cemetery. And in this dream, he saw himself coming to his own tombstone and reading what was written on his tombstone. That's a fascinating dream. And here's what he saw on his own tombstone in the dream. Thomas Oden, he made no new contribution to theology. And he said, I woke up and I was refreshed and relieved. In other words, he said, that, that's who I want to be. I want to be like the church fathers. I don't want to say anything new. I want to be faithful to Scripture. I've spent half my life trying to say things that people have never said before, pushing frontiers, new, new, new. And what I've discovered is that those who really walked with God were seeking to be faithful to Scripture. And so he says, I set about trying scrupulously to abstain from creating any new doctrine. It was the best decision I had ever made. It took no small effort to resist the constant temptation to novelty. By the way, as the buyers of books, let's, let's not encourage those who are always on about novelty, right? Don't buy the books that are always on about novelty. Buy the books that you know are going to be faithful. He says that it took no small effort to overcome this constant temptation to novelty because nothing at Yale was drummed into my head more steadily than the aspiration that the theology I would seek would be my own and it would uh, have its uniqueness and my imprint on it. But by 1972, I was pledged to present nothing new or original in basic Christian teaching that would have my initials stamped on it as if it were mine. I have honored that pledge, and it has been deeply gratifying to me. And summarizing the whole of his life, the man's now 85. He says, the first half of my life, he said, if my first 40 years were spent hungering for the meaning of life, the last 40 have been spent in being fed. Isn't that beautiful? I spent 40 years looking for the meaning of life. Out there on all these frontiers, I never found it. I came back to the Word of God, sought to be faithful to it. I've spent the last 40 years of my life being fed. Being fed. Friend, if you are wise in your own eyes, God will be little more than a question mark to you. You won't have much desire to pray. And even if you join a Bible study group, here's what will happen. You'll go for years and years simply uh, agreeing with what you already agree with and filtering out everything else so that you never actually change. And what's really happening is that you're listening to an echo of your own voice rather than actually submitting yourself to the voice of God. That is exactly what the Pharisees did. Do you remember how Jesus said to the Pharisees, look, you study the Scriptures because you think that by them they have eternal, you have eternal life, but these are the Scriptures that bear witness about me, and yet you will not come to me that you may have life. What you're doing is you're looking at the Scriptures, but you're looking at it in such a way that you're filtering out everything that does not fit your preconceived grid. But here's the promise of Jesus. 
if you will open the Scriptures with a humble heart, that's our theme today, not pride, humble. If you will open the Scriptures with a humble heart, God will teach you. Jesus said this, and it's wonderful. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Now, look at these words of Scripture for just a moment longer. He's saying, our Lord is saying, if you will come to Scripture with a humble heart, here's what will happen. You will hear. You will hear God's voice. If you come without the filter, a humble heart, Lord, speak to me, and let my mind be reshaped by your word. Let me get off this idea that I've got all the wisdom that I need in and of myself. Then you will hear God's voice. Then you will learn of Him. And Jesus says, whenever a person is taught by God, here's the result. They come to me. They come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the Savior says. Never be wise in your own eyes. So, I end here for today. Thoughtful Christians surely find ourselves wondering what God is doing in this troubled season of our national life, and I for sure don't have the answer to that question. But one thing surely is very clear. When pride, haughty eyes, being wise in your own sight is paraded before us day after day after day, to the point where vast numbers of people find themselves saying, switch off that television, I cannot watch anymore. Perhaps this is a moment where we can actually learn to hate our own worst sins. Perhaps God will bring us, even today, to a place of saying, Lord, deliver me from having eyes that are haughty. May I never look down on another person. Lord, may I never be wise in my own sight. Make me humble so that I am in a position where I can be taught by you and taught by others. The gospel in its very nature cuts pride to shreds because it casts all of us on the mercy of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and we are justified by His grace as a gift. And how did the gift come? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So, for every Christian, we always live with this question, what do you have that you did not receive? Everything that is in my life, every good gift that has come from above has come from the gracious and kind hand of the Lord. That's why the gospel moved Saul of Tarsus from thinking he was the cream of the crop to confessing that he was the chief of sinners. That's a big change. Cream of the crop in regards to the law, he says, looking back on his earlier life in regards uh, to the law, blameless. That's that I was the best of the best. You see the haughtiness of that? But when he comes to know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, what does he say? He says, I'm the chief of sinners. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. So, where then is boasting? It is excluded, the book of Romans says, because in the gospel, God destroys pretensions and He very wonderfully abolishes all distinctions because there is one way to peace for, with God from those who are far and those who are near, one hope for the richest and the poorest, one sacrifice for the Jews and for the Gentiles, one Savior whose arms are open to every person who will humble themselves and come in faith and repentance to Him. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, 
my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. May I never boast except in the cross of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Do not be overtaken by the evil of the arrogance and the haughtiness and the all wisdom lies in me that is all around. Do not be haughty. Never be wise in your own eyes. Do not be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good, so that in the light of God's mercy, we live in harmony with one another. Father, please help us in humbling ourselves in order to pursue the beautiful calling that you have granted to us in a world that desperately needs to see something that reflects the image and the beauty of Jesus. For these things we ask in the Savior's name and everyone together said,